Thank you, Jack, for the introduction. Jack has been my advisor and mentor for almost 20 years now. Uh, and he has seen me through a lot and he has helped me through a lot and I am grateful to him and I'm kind of grateful that this kind of serves as a precursor to the celebration that we will have of him on Monday. I um, want to thank President Rector uh, who at the time was also my dean when I had the opportunity to go on sabbatical. So thankful to, to President Rector, at that time President Amerson, and the Committee on Faculty who made my sabbatical possible. So the lecture title is From Sabbath Schools to Freedom Schools, Public Theology and the Power of Voice. I really do hope that I kind of touch on some of that, <laughs> um, but we'll see how that goes. Um, I want to start, um, because I'm not a lecturer, I lead discussion. And so I need y'all to participate for at least two or three minutes, okay? And I want you to think about the question, what do you believe is the purpose of Christian education? Now, for those who are my students, you will know what probably my response will end up being, so I don't need you to share that just yet. Um, but think about what do you believe is the purpose of Christian education, and for the next minute, kind of share that with your partner. Or does somebody sit next to you? So I like to hear from about two or three of you. I think that's what we have time for. Uh, who would like to share? What do you believe to be the purpose of Christian education? I only got to 5 o'clock, y'all. I will. Yes. And I don't remember what you said in class. That makes me sad. <laughs> I have it in my notes. Um, I shared that Christian education is, um, what did I say? It's a, a space and a place to offer children, youth, and adults um, to encounter Christ, to form formation of their understanding of Christ in their lives, being relevant, incarnational. Awesome. Thank you. Someone else? We talk about the uh, formation and empowerment of disciples mm -hmm. for the mission of the church. And that implies, among other things, the recognition of the charisma, the gifts given by the Spirit. Thank you. And I'll take one more. Yes. Oh. You? Oh, we, we talked about <laughs> what we think it should be and what we think it should not be. Okay. One of the things we talk about it not being is um, creating cookie cutter images of who we are. And we talked about how we see it as a thread that undergirds the work of the church such that we empower people to live out the Christian Thank you. All of those are great, great purposes for Christian Ed, and I'm sure that the ones that I did not hear were also um, right on target. Uh, I want to offer another one, my own, that you can add to your sense and your purpose of Christian Ed. And all my classes ha have seen this and known this. I believe that the purpose of Christian education is to set people free. Free to be children of God and free to be co-creators with God. And so for the time that we have, allow me to unpack this statement by first sharing uh, the theological anthropology that undergirds it and to demonstrate how it's been, how it's been engaged historically and presently through the Sabbath schools of, Re of the Reconstruction era the Freedom Schools conducted during the summer of 1964, and the Freedom Schools as they are run today through the work of the Children's Defense Fund. And as I go through this, think about your own theological anthropology that undergirds your sense of the purpose of Christian education. The theological anthropology that undergirds my belief that the purpose of Christian education is to set people free 
to be free to be children of God and free to be co-creators with God is rooted in a notion more particularly term ontological vocation. Ontological vocation is a term I adopted from Brazilian educator Paulo Freire, who in his work Pedagogy of the Oppressed advocates a way of teaching and learning which attempts to transform oppressed persons by awakening in them an innate calling or vocation to become more fully human. Ferrari suggests that this innate calling is ontological. The oppressed in their quest for liberation are to see themselves, as he says, engaged in the ontological and historical vocation of becoming more fully human. I define ontological vocation as the intimate and inseparable bond between existence and calling. It is predicated on the belief that God calls all of humanity into existence for a meaningful and unique purpose. It further argues that one identify, one's identity most fundamentally resides in the knowledge and belief that, and this is using James Fowler's words, that one is called by God to serve as God's agent, steward, and partner in the caring and recreating of God's creation. Walter Brueggemann helps me explain this notion as he shares the following, and I quote, the notion of identity questions is based on the assumption that the person in and of himself or herself has within his or her body an identity to be embraced. Identity questions are by definition self-focused. Identity for a person is given in the call to the other one, capital O. It is the voice of the initiating one who calls human persons to destiny. Maturation is coming to terms in free ways with that which galvanizes God's purpose in our lives." End quote. Brueggemann, in an attempt to explain how in our humanness one can participate in covenant with God and with others, suggests that in light of covenantal relations, all identity questions transform into vocational questions. He says the dynamic of humanness, of humanness is in the interaction between the one who calls and the one who is called. And the agenda between them is a calling, end quote. Vocation is not for Brueggemann a job or a profession, but a reason for being in the world that is also related to God's purposes. We are not speaking here of our mother's ambitions for us, or an institutional blueprint for our lives, Brueggemann says, but of the dreams of the one in whom we are grounded. Vocation means we are called by this one who has called us or calling us to service. Ontological vocation can best be understood then in terms of who I understand God has called me to be. Howard Thurman serves as another critical voice in, in illuminating this notion of ontological vocation for me. Thurman's thoughts on religious experience, commitment, which he defines as interrelationship between freedom and responsibility, and Thurman's understanding of self-worth clearly articulate what I try to convey concerning ontological vocation. Thurman's understanding of commitment rises out of his understanding of the nature of freedom, responsibility, and life. Liberation, synonymous to freedom for Thurman, is a very key theme to Thurman's theology. Thurman's sense of liberation focuses inward on those elements that keep persons from believing they are free. Thurman asserts that one is not free if outside forces dictate. And I quote, the basis of one's inner togetherness, one's sense of inner authority, must never be at the mercy of factors in our environment, however significant they may be. Nothing from the outside can destroy a man until he opens the door and lets it in. I'm needing to resonate on that after yesterday's election. For Thurman, inner freedom cannot be conquered unless there is also internal acquiescence. A person achieves liberation or freedom when the human person as being is no longer defined, limited, and controlled by external powers, 
but is creatively empowered by those principles of self-determination that allows one to actualize total realization of being, irrespective of the limitations imposed upon him by external milieu. A person can be denied liberty, which Thurman defines as an external force that is bestowed or withheld according to the will, judgment, and behavior of someone other than self, whereas freedom is internal and cannot be denied unless it is forfeited. For freedom is an individual's birthright from God. This discipline of commitment involves for Thurman the inescapable demand of surrender, not to other individuals, but to God. Thus for Thurman, commitment means that it is possible for, for a man to yield the nerve center of his consent to a purpose or cause, a movement or an ideal which may be more important to him than whether he lives or dies. The commitment is a free self-conscious act of will by which he affirms the identification with, uh, with what he is committed to. The character of his consent is determined by that to which the center or core of his consent is given. And please forgive Thurman's not being in inclusive language. Uh, Thurman argues that a discipline of commitment provides answers to the classical existential questions, who am I and what do I want? The answer to who am I begins with a person recognizing his or her fragmentary nature. Many of us, Thurman suggests, are like the madman Jesus encountered, who when asked his name cried out, my name is Legion. Thurman postulates what Legion could have further stated. Thurman says, this is the pit of my agony. There are so many of me and they riot in my street. If only I could know who I am, which one of me, then I would be made whole again. I would have a center, a self, a rallying point deep within me for all the chaos until at last the chaos would become order. For Thurman, one finds self, one becomes a whole person, one answers the question, who am I, when one chooses to surrender all the collective fragments of oneself that one knows of to God, resulting in one being connected with a commitment big enough to demand one's all. One's encounter with God provides an opportunity to center and focus one's fragments on those things that God wills for that person. And what do I want, Thurman suggests, flows directly from how one answers, who am I? If one has surrendered his or her fragmentary nature over to God and has chosen to have that nature focused on God's will and purpose for their life, then Thurman suggests that the answer to what do I want will be intimately connected to God's will and purpose. Thurman states, when a man faces this question put to him by life, or when he is caught up in the necessity of answering it, or by deliberate intent seeks an answer, he is at once involved in the dynamics of commitment. At such a moment, he knows what, in the what, what is in the living of his life. He must be for and what he must be against. For me then, Christian education is about helping persons embrace an ontological vocational understanding that their life has meaning and purpose. It is helping, helping persons embrace an understanding that they are called by God to serve as God's agent, steward, and partner in the caring and recreating of God's creation. It's echoing the writer of Jeremiah who writes, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. It also echoes the writer of Ephesians who writes, for we, are what we, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. But if the purpose of Christian education is to set people free, then it seems to presuppose that there are situations and circumstances that hinder, bind, and obstruct the ability to live free. 
If we embrace an ontological vocational understanding that we are called to serve as God's agent, steward, and partner in this caring and recreating of God's creation, Christian educators have the call to equip those entrusted to their care with this understanding and to serve as a catalyst to in assisting to remove situations and circumstances that hinder, bind, or obstruct the ability of people to live free. And I want to demonstrate what this looks like through the role of Sabbath schools, which were in place during the time immediately following the end of the enslavement of persons of African descent. I also want to do this through freedom schools that were uh, taking place in Freedom Summer of 1964 and the Freedom Schools of today. Historically, one of the roles of the black church that the black church played in the lives of the people entrusted to her care is that of educator and nurturer. Through her role as educator and nurturer, the black church was very influential as a socializing agent of self-worth and self-esteem building. The church reminded persons of African descent that they were somebody, even if the dominant society worked hard to convince them otherwise. In times when African Americans were denied educational opportunity and were the object of blatant disrespect and abuse, both physically and emotionally, the black church provided not only moral and intellectual instruction, but through such instruction offered and instilled a sense of self-worth and self-determination within adults and youth. Education was a critical vehicle to the black church, uh, that the black church used to help fashion a sense of ontological vocational understanding, a sense of identity and purpose among community members who daily experienced the degradation of their personhood. Educational historian James D. Anderson in his work, The Education of Blacks in the South, 1860 to 1935, provides an insightful view of the importance of education to the newly emancipated persons during the period of Reconstruction. Anderson's historical account portray an, emancip an, an emancipated people thirsty for freedom, and for many, education served as that gateway. Anderson and others argue that the quest to be literate and, educa and educated finds its roots in the strivings of enslaved people to be educated during the antebellum era. Thomas A. Jones, a North Carolinian enslaved in the mid-19th century, learned to read in the back of his enslaver's store. Jones is quoted as saying, it seems to me that if I could learn to read and write, this learning might, nay, I really thought it would point out to me the ways to freedom, influence, and real secure happiness. Jones endured three brutal whippings in efforts to conceal his pursuit for literacy. To these enslaved persons who were willing to, ta to take the risk of experiencing beatings or even death, education was viewed as a gateway to freedom and liberation. African Americans carried that passion into emancipation and the Reconstruction period. Albert Roberto, in his work, Canaan Land, A Religious History of African Americans, stated the following. Harriet Ware, a white northern teacher in Port Royal, Virginia, noticed the religious awe with which the freed people viewed education. Attending a funeral in 1862, she observed, as we drew near to the grave, we heard all the children singing their ABCs. Through and through again, as they stood waiting around the grave, each child had his school book or picture book in his hand, another proof that they considered their lessons as, a, as in some sort of religious exercises. The desire to read the Bible for themselves, the Bible the slaveholders had so long misinterpreted to them, motivated a good many former slaves to seek education. What became a primary goal of many of the ex-enslaved persons was the desire to start their own schools and have responsibility for shaping them. All across the South were self-sustained or native schools where ex-enslaved people were, tra were training themselves and others how to read and write. 
and one form of these self-sustained schools was the Sabbath schools. In many communities, Sabbath schools served as the precursor to free or public schools. These church-sponsored schools functioned primarily in the evenings and on the weekends, reaching thousands who could not attend school during the day. These schools equipped their students with basic literary skills along with Christian instruction. Anderson points out that Sabbath schools remained viable well into the post-Reconstruction era. Anderson reports that in 1868, the African Methodist Episcopal Church had enrolled 40,000 students in its Sabbath schools. And by 1885, the enrollment had, dra had dramatically increased to 200,000 students receiving intellectual and moral instruction. In fact, all of the educational institutions of the African Methodist Episcopal Church at that time functioned under a moral, religious, and liberal arts philosophy that was intended to prepare African Americans for life. Self-determination, a vital part of the socializing process, was the primary agenda within the educational movement of the ex-slaves. Sabbath schools emerged out of, out of a belief that if the barrier of illiteracy is removed, former enslaved persons could live free. It started with a belief that former enslaved persons were people of worth. Christian education served as a socializing agent to remind persons that they were created to live free. And living free demanded they dismantle the obstacle that illiteracy created. And this same understanding was at the heart of the creation and the conducting of freedom schools in the summer of 1964. The Mississippi Freedom Schools were developed as part of the 1964 Freedom Summer, 50 years ago. The 1964 Freedom Summer Civil Rights Project that was organized by the Council of Federated Organizations which was an umbrella civil rights organization that included as its members SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, CORE, Congress of Racial Equality, NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Council. Freedom Summer was essentially a statewide voter registration campaign and the framers called for 1,000 volunteers to assist in the undertaking. During the planning of the Freedom Summer Project, SNCC Field Secretary Charles Cobb po proposed a network of freedom schools that would foster self-awareness, self-determination, and political participation among Mississippi elementary and high school students, in addition to offering literacy development and discussions. His proposal was accepted and in March 1964 a curriculum planning conference was organized in New York under the sponsorship of the National Council of Churches. The purpose of the curriculum design uh, was to design a progressive civic curriculum to explore new styles and democratic methodology that will enable students to see their worth, their dignity, and forge out programs to liberate themselves, to develop a critical attitude which allows them to think, to question, to begin to reevaluate themselves, especially in terms of Mississippi's oppressive social order. What I'd like to do now is share with you a short video clip that talks about the Freedom Schools. Uh, and this is taken from the PBS dec uh, documentary, Freedom Summer. One of the most wonderful things about 1964 Mississippi summer were the Freedom Schools. The state of Mississippi 
deliberately and systematically kept black people uneducated and ignorant, and then turned around and made education a requirement in order to participate in the political process. We were able to do the Freedom Schools in the summer of 1964 because we had almost a thousand students coming to the state of Mississippi, thus the human resources to actually, you know, conduct classes. We hope to find and develop and mold local leadership among the young people. We also hope to promote a better self-image among the local Negroes. We would send out mass uh, flyers and, and everything to the churches, uh, telling people about the Freedom School, what the Freedom School was going to entail, uh, the courses, uh, the activities. We got the preachers involved, we got the kids involved. Black people couldn't go to the library. It was for whites only. And so here they are, got their own library now. They would come excited to be exposed to the teaching and to browse the books. In the public schools where I was in school, I had never heard of Dr. Seuss. It was at Freedom School where we actually not only read the story of the cat in the hat, but we acted it out. Having our lives enriched by these activities really made a huge difference in my life. We taught um, African American history, civics, African culture, African dance. They were learning uh, black history, that they were reading books that had been written by blacks that they'd never heard of. How were slaves first introduced in America? As we saw back on this world map over here, America started picking up slaves along here and then bringing them back. What we were trying to do that summer is get people to talk about their own lives, talk about good and bad, and talk about ways in which you could bring about change. I think that was very much the drive of the, the program. They had a sense of being needed by something much bigger than themselves and a sense of being able to handle the problems that they were needed for. They did it by by asking questions and by being encouraged to feel free to ask questions. They were raring to go. We were just kind of like the catalyst. We were agents of information and agents of a different world. So I mean, just the very fact that we were talking about a world that they didn't know or didn't have much experience with was exciting to them and also to us. We set them up uh, for the little children to come and every day we'd have classrooms of adults, people uh, 50, 60, and 70 years of age. The adults came to the Freedom School to learn, just like the little children. very similar to what I share with you as to what took place during Sabbath schools. That's what took place the summer of 1964. George Chil Chilcott and Jerry Ligon in their article, Discussion as a Means for Transformative Change, Social Studies Lessons for the from the Mississippi Freedom Schools, states that Freedom Schools became a font of real activity during the Mississippi Project. Students began to have a sense of themselves as people who could be taken seriously. They were encouraged to talk, and their talk was listened to. They became articulate about what was wrong and what changes should be made. Connections between curriculum and personal experience 
was made as students studied the realities of conditions in Mississippi and the effort and the effects of these uh, realities on their lives. Students discovered that they were that they that they were real human beings and that they could alter realities by taking action against the injustices that kept them unhappy and impotent. The Freedom School movement uh, did not last uh, coming out of the summer of 1964 for a variety of reasons that we can go into at another time. But there was one who was there uh, in 1964. Her name is Marion Wright Edelman. <laughs> and the Freedom School movement was rebirthed again in 1992. And according to the historical outline shared on the Children's Defense Fund's website, the Freedom School movement was reborn in 1992 under Marion Wright's leadership and the Children's Defense Fund's Black Community Crusade for Children's program to advance this transforming vision of education for all children uh, through the CDF Freedom Schools program. In the words of Dr. John Hope Franklin, who was then an honorary co-chair of the BCCC program, he says, we want our children to appreciate fully the artistic, moral, and spiritual values that will bring to them much of their heritage of the past and make it possible to pass them on to their successors. We want to help our children develop an understanding and appreciation for family, for their own rich heritage derived from their African forebearers as well as their American, exp American experience. The kind of understanding that will simultaneously provide them with roots and wings. The core beliefs and educational philosophy that guide the Children's Defense Fund Freedom Schools and all Children's Defense Fund Youth programs are the following. The core, uh, all children are capable of learning and achieving high standards. Culture and community conditions influence child learning. Appreciation and knowledge of one's culture engenders self-worth and the ability to live in community with others. Education, teachers, and mentors are transformative agents. Literacy is essential to personal empowerment and civic responsibility. Effective teaching requires planning, creativity, and implementation with reflection and processing. Learning communities that offer a sense of safety, love, caring, and personal power are needed for transformative education. Classroom discipline and management are integral parts of instructional practice. Parents are crucial partners in children's learning and need support to become better parents. As citizens, children and adults have the power to make a difference in their communities and be advocates for themselves. The Children's Defense Fund continues this whole notion of ontological vocational understanding that children have identity and purpose, that they have worth. Uh, uh, they were created with worth by God. And churches all across the country are homes to CDF Freedom Schools, engaging in ways to do Christian education that set children free. A study of the Freedom Schools by the University of Charlotte shows that the program's aims of CDF Freedom Schools are successful. Quoting from their report specifically, we found that over a third of the sample which was 38.6% maintained independent reading levels by the end of the summer. The data also showed that at least half of the 132 children assessed improved or showed gains in independent reading as measured by the BRI at the end of the program. Another way to interpret this data is to say that most students maintain or gain independent reading levels at grade levels, independent reading levels at grade level and did not slide back 
during the summertime. Both outcomes are desirable outcomes for the Freedom School Partners and the Children's Defense Fund model program. During this past summer, there were three Freedom Schools in the Chicago area operating, all run by church or faith-based ministries. And I want to just say that we are in desperate need of more. A recent Huffington Post article reported that in 2011-2012 school year, just 68% of black students graduated on time from Illinois' public school system, compared to 82% of the total student population. In Chicago, three out of 10 freshmen at Chicago public schools don't graduate on time. In 2009, the Chicago Sun-Times shared results from a report from the City of Colleges of Chicago showing that more than 2,800 Chicago public school high school graduates heading straight to one of these city colleges, out of that 2,800, 71% needed remedial reading, 81% needed remedial English, and 94% needed remedial math. At the University of Chicago, there is a program called the 30 Million Words Initiative. And this program emerged in an attempt to address studies that show that by the time children from lower income households reach the age of three, they will have heard 30 million fewer total words and engaged in fewer back and forth conversations than their more affluent peers. A gap that is later associated with disparities in language development, school readiness, and long-term education outcomes of students. It is almost a uh, proven study that demonstrates the uh, birth to prison pipeline that takes place in our communities that affects lower income young people. If we believe that the purpose of Christian education is to set people free, then Christian education must also commit itself to being a catalyst in removing barriers that keep persons for, from, from fulfilling their call to serve as God's agent, steward, and partner in the caring and recreating of God's creation. Christian education is not about just passing on instruction. It's about saving lives. It's about teaching folk how to live. And if you don't remember anything else, I want you to remember the work that's taking place with the Children's Defense Funds um, Freedom Schools in its effort in partnership with faith-based organizations, with churches to engage in a different kind of Christian education to improve the literacy, the self-esteem, the self-determination uh, in the lives of the young people that they work with. And they have an awesome curriculum that they use. And one of the, and it's filled with the reading of books. It's also filled with uh, various songs and other things that help to uh, uh, strengthen and fortify uh, their sense of self-worth. And one of the songs that serves as a motivational song for uh, the Freedom School for the six to eight weeks that they are in uh, session is a song that I gave you a copy of. Does everybody have a copy? <laughs> Something Inside So Strong. And what I want to do, I found a wonderful clip <laughs> of the children engaged in this song. And so I close with sharing this with you. Deny me, you can't be so. 
I was singing the walls of Jericho away, 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 away. I'm tumbling down, down, down to the ground. I put my face inside, news for the world that's mine. My light will shine so brightly. I can't see, I can't see. to the, the, the voters' rights. Correct. And it seems to me that in light of yesterday, and the, 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 what seems to me the constant erosion of voters' rights, particularly among people of color, people of poverty, in order to, to keep them from realizing the political empowerment, uh, are the, <coughs> the current freedom schools trying to make the connection between uh, personal empowerment and political empowerment in the way that... Yes, very much so.
Very much so. Um, one of the, uh, Virginia and I went to the Samuel Proctor uh, conference on child advocacy. And um, one of the things that took place every day was calling our congressman, calling our senator, uh, related to some particular issue that connected to child advocacy work. So part of, that, that's embedded. The whole public policy notion is embedded in, in the curriculum and the work that it does. Well, I mean, it, it trying to instill the necessity for the children to grow up and become involved in political Yes, yes. yes. So it, it goes beyond advocacy, but sort of a mentoring. No, I, it, it, it's very much part of what, what that's there. So I have a quick question. Um, given, and this is just my assessment of the matter before, since the donatist tendency is coming out in me. Which tendencies is that? The donatist. <laughs> given that the Christian church is probably the most powerful hindrance to the realization of the full recognition of black humanity here in these United States. Mm -hmm. And that uh, it is only sort of segments and transient portions of it committed to that project. Hmm. How does constructing just the language of Christian education not lead to a naivete that is seeking the church's participation in the realization of the recognition of black humanity when it is probably the greatest hindrance to it mm. in many parts of these here in the United States? Awesome question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have an easy answer for that. I think that uh, it requires those who are intentional about uh, saving lives intentional about uh, truly setting people free and willing to uh, uh, acknowledge the barriers that our society creates um, uh, that keeps people from living out their full humanity. Uh, it requires intentional folk um, uh, to commit themselves to that. Uh, I, don't, I don't live in a naivete that, that, that believes that uh, just because I've just shared it with all of y'all that is everybody's going to run out and act right. Because uh, I know you're not. <laughs> uh, we're going we're gonna to go back to status quo on a number, in a number of situations. I think we just need to be honest about that. But I want to believe that there's our few who are going to uh, uh, hear what I say, take what I say, believe, believe what I say, and in their sphere of influence, work to make a difference. So you talk about committed folk, but, but, I, but what about committed students? Because one of the things I heard in the clip, which I thought was wonderful, was that this was all, the freedom schools were made possible because there were a thousand students um, who, who, who came, right? Um, but what Clari Clarifying, there was a thousand vol adult volunteers. Okay, a thousand adult volunteers. So, but wasn't there, wasn't there a sense back then of a collective problem? So, so collectively, uh, African Americans wanted to learn how to read. And there was a, a communal sense, a communal response. We want our kids to read. I want to learn how to read. I want to be an adult reader. But, but, but that doesn't exist today in a sense that, that more, instead of that collect, collective communal sense, it, it's, it's a mark of shame. So, so this idea of learning, of being illiterate, of being behind a little bit, we don't have the communal commitment as much. I don't think that the approach of Freedom Schools approaches from the standpoint of you're illiterate, so we're going to train you. As a matter of fact, all of the children are called scholars. So there's a, there, there, there's a mindset uh, uh, of the program that I believe you have it in you to be all that God has created you to be. And so I'm going to treat you as such. And so, um, and so the adults who are trained to work with them are trained to approach young people not from a deficit but from the assets that they already have. Any other questions? 
Yes. Sixty thousand dollars. <laughs> but it's 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 uh, again it's about commitment. It's about signing up, and the sixty thousand dollars is not to give to uh, Children's Defense Fund. It really is about uh, ordering the library. That is um, part of it. It's the training. All it includes the training. They bring all of the um, adult leaders um, to Knoxville. Uh, at Haley's farm to engage in training. Uh, and they couldn't hold them all at Haley this year because they had like, what, 1,900? It was the um, Ella Baker Scholars, the young, the, um, young adults and teenagers. There were so many that, um, so that mentoring part was had as well. Right. And so it's, again, the church making the commitment to uh, engage in a different way of doing Christian education and wanting to be a part of this programming. And as many of you have been hearing, uh, we at Garrett are looking at a, uh, being a, a partner here in the community to help establish a freedom school here in Evanston by 2016. What were the three? Where were the three? And two things. Where were the three in Chicago? And then how long does a freedom school last? How many weeks? Two I'm not remembering right now. It's on the Children's Defense Fund's website, but the but the, the third that I do know is Trinity UCC. Uh, it's a summer program, lasts eight weeks. Six to eight weeks um, for, for the summer. But one of the things that I learned um, at attending the Proctor Conference uh, this past summer is that there, ha there are also organizations who have found ways to extend the work of the Freedom School over a year-long period of time. Because it seems, in some respects, it seems this could be a great replacement for vacation Bible school. <laughs> it's even much deeper than that, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> and, and again, what many folk do is partner with their local yeah. uh, elementary school, junior high school, um, that they already have a relationship with, yeah, as well as others in the community. Hmm. Yes. A great asset to have or to use um, is an organization called One Church, One School, um, which is actually their headquarters is here in Chicago at my home church, Carter Temple <laughs> CME Church on 7th and at Wabash. And they have uh, implemented freedom schools throughout um, the founder of, of that organization, Bishop Henry M. Williamson of the CME Church. And so they are trying to find churches and schools to participate, but they just can never find enough people to, to want to volunteer and participate. So if you know congregations or persons, organizations who want to contribute and create a freedom school, they are the organization to call and they will help you, give you resources, whatever you need to implement and to start a freedom school. Thank you. Excellent organization, One Church, One School. So do you have, I'm sorry, do you have, um, can you give us some thoughts on how we, you, because you said we'll go back to status quo. How do we not do that? How do we walk away from something like this committed in very real ways as a collective community to respond? Now, do y'all want my real honest answer to that? <laughs> I do, but. <laughs> <laughs> you got to make the choice that you want to do it. It really is the bottom line. We can only make changes when we decide that we want to do it. And when we decide that we want to make changes, resources and opportunities and everything will appear to us. But if we want to hem and ha and wait for somebody and, you know, to show us the way or take the lead, then nothing's going to ever happen. Um, we have as our tagline, we're supposed to be bold leaders. We got to be bold leaders. Bold leaders don't wait on other people to tell them how to do it. Bold leaders go after it and make it happen. We got to be bold leaders. Thank y'all. <laughs>